Hello and welcome back to Multivariable Calculus, the video series where we do analysis with several variables. And one important concept there, which we have already introduced, is the one of a diffeomorphism. And now in today's part 22, we will extend this to a so-called local diffeomorphism. Indeed, it turns out that this is a very important concept because so-called coordinate transformations are local diffeomorphisms. And this is exactly what we will discuss today, but as always, first I want to thank all the nice people who support this channel on Steady, here on YouTube or via other means. And as a big thank you, you can download additional material for all the videos with the link in the description. Okay, and with that, let's immediately recall the notion of a diffeomorphism from the last video. We just take two open sets in Rn and let's call them u and v. And then we just have a bijective map f that goes from u to v. And then we call the map a diffeomorphism if it's in both directions differentiable. More precisely, we want that it is continuously differentiable of order k. And then we have our ck diffeomorphism and you see it's a global definition. Everything has to work on the whole set u and the whole set v and we need to have a one-to-one -one correspondence between them. However, often we don't have this, but we still want to have the behavior of a ck diffeomorphism. This means maybe we could weaken the definition and just talk about a smaller set in u. And on the right hand side we also take a smaller set in v. And now I would say let's simply call them u tilde and v tilde. And now the requirement is that we have the diffeomorphism only on the smaller sets u tilde and v tilde. So our map still works as a ck diffeomorphism but not globally anymore. Hence if we don't have the bijectivity here maybe we can just zoom in and then we have it. And if that works for a lot of small sets when we zoom in then this might also be helpful for calculations. To see that we can immediately look at an important example. And for this I would say let's go to the two-dimensional polar coordinates. And these can just be described by a map which we call capital Phi. And there our domain is given by the positive real number line in the Cartesian product with the whole number line. And then we can just describe the whole plane R2 which means the codomain is given by R2. And now from the positive real number line we take the variable name r and from the other one the variable name lowercase phi. So you might be familiar with that. We have a radius and an angle phi. Hence the idea here is very simple. We just describe the point by the distance from the origin and by the angle from the x-axis. So in the picture we would say here we find our r and there we find our phi. So what we get here is that for the x coordinate we find r times the cosine and for the y coordinate we have r times the sine of phi. And that's it. This is the whole definition for the polar coordinates in two dimensions. And we immediately recognize this is not a bijective map because we don't hit the origin at all. We would hit it if we included the zero here on the left hand side but then we would not have an open set. However, this one we could easily repair just by excluding the origin here on the right hand side. But then still we should ask, is this a well-defined C1 diffeomorphism? And in order to see that, we can just calculate the Jacobian for this map phi. This is not so complicated because we just have to know the derivatives of the cosine and the sine function. And this gives us in the second column minus r times the sine function of phi and plus r cosine function of phi. And then we see we have this nice 2 times 2 matrix and we can easily calculate the determinant. Indeed, we immediately get that this is r times cosine squared plus sine squared. And this one I can keep short because as you might know the Pythagorean theorem tells us that this is always equal to 1. Hence what we get here is that the Jacobian of phi is equal to r so it's never equal to 0. 
so it's always positive simply because the radius r is chosen to be a positive number. Therefore, as we know from the last video, this map has a chance to be a diffeomorphism. However, this is not the case in the global definition from before. And the reason for that is simply that capital phi is not injective, because our angle phi can make more turns. Hence, we don't have a diffeomorphism here. Okay, so now you might think that we can also repair this problem by simply changing the domain here. However, if we do that, in the end, we also have to remove half an axis here in the image. So it's possible to get a diffeomorphism, but then we have to change the domain and the codomain even more. And there you see, this already goes into the direction of a local definition for a diffeomorphism. So let's see what this means in the picture. So here we have our domain. In the x direction it's simply 0 to infinity and in the y direction we have the whole number line. And now we know capital Phi maps this to R2 without the origin. So for example this horizontal line here does not change at all, so we have it here, but every vertical line is now a circle in the picture on the right. Hence, with that we also understand what happens locally for the map, which means what is the image if we restrict the domain to this small rectangle. Indeed, if it's small enough, we get this small part of the disk on the right hand side. And then we immediately see, for these two sets, we don't have any problems with injectivity and subjectivity. This means, if we restrict phi to these two sets, we get a nice bijective map. And since we already know that the determinant of the Jacobian is never zero, we get a nice diffeomorphism. Indeed, this important connection we will discuss in more detail later. First, I want to give you the correct definition of a local diffeomorphism. So there we just start with a map in Rn. And there the domain and codomain are just given by two sets u and v. So we don't need open sets there because we go to open sets by zooming in anyway. Hence any map between u and v is called a local diffeomorphism if we can do something like that. More concretely we would say f is a local ck diffeomorphism at a given point x in u. So this means we want this local behavior only around a given point x in u. Therefore it's already good enough to find an open set around x. So this is exactly what we require here. We want to have an open set u tilde in Rn which is also a subset in u. And obviously the same thing we want to have on the right hand side. So there we find an open set v tilde. And then as before we want that f is bijective when we restrict it to these two sets. And in fact we want to have even more because we want to have a ck diffeomorphism. Therefore we write f restricted to u tilde and there we actually mean restriction to domain and codomain which means we also have v tilde on the right. And now as already mentioned this map now should be our ordinary CK diffeomorphism. And you know all the requirements for that. We need open sets in domain and codomain, we need a bijection and we need that the map and the inverse are k times continuously differentiable. So this is our CK diffeomorphism and this definition tells us it works at the point x. However, as already mentioned before, often we want that it works at every point x. And this leads us to the next definition. We call f simply a local ck diffeomorphism if the thing from above works for every x in u. So in short we could just say it's a local ck diffeomorphism at x for every x in u. And for the long version we would just repeat that for each x in u we find open sets. And then for these open sets we also want to have our ck diffeomorphism. Hence we can just copy that from before and our definition is finished. 
So in summary, you can see a local CK diffeomorphism can mean two things. Either we mean it locally at a given point or we mean it for every point in the set. And now in order to close this video, I should tell you about some important examples. Indeed, we have seen that the polar coordinates from before form a local C1 diffeomorphism. So maybe we still have to check it explicitly for every point, but it already looked nice. Moreover, in a very similar way, we can also check that the polar coordinates in three dimensions also form a C1 diffeomorphism. However, again, the important part is, it only works with the local definition. And now you might already guess, we can continue this whole discussion and talk about other coordinate systems as well. Another important example is given by the cylindrical coordinates. And the result there is the same. It might not work globally as a C1 diffeomorphism, but it always works locally. And as we will see later, for example with the integration, it's already good enough to have it locally. Therefore, the next step would be to find a nice criterion to check for a local diffeomorphism. And as you might already know, this is given by the determinant of the Jacobian matrix as we have done it before. So what we get is an inverse function theorem and we will discuss that in the next video. So I really hope we meet there again and have a nice day. Bye bye.